This is the NeoBooks call for Monday, August 12th, 2024. Um, Klaus, nice to see you. Jack's awesome for you, uh, of you to join us. Um, and Jax was just explaining to me her the construction of her um, family name, which is a, a, a constructed name, an, an invented name, a, a, a chosen name. That's probably the best way to say it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, which is cool. And so I, I assume you speak Gaelic? Um, no, no, I, I don't. I mean, I have Irish roots, so it's a it's a call for me back to my Irish roots, uh, essentially. And um, my 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 uh, my family name uh, was McCarthy, which is a very common Irish name, and um, nothing wrong with McCarthy. Uh, but um, Jax is also a chosen name, so I went through a bit of a process. But coming up with the um, Gaelic name was about, um, came out of research and some conversations, which sort of threw me back a thousand years. And um, it means daughter of love, so it's quite a oh, um, wow. it's quite a rich name. And uh, it, and I liked it because McCarthy is actually kind of um, was the name that developed out of a um, uh, a few, lots of people who couldn't say ni ni cartag. <laughs> um, Jose uh, Jose, sorry, um, thanks for joining. Uh, we have a new participant from Australia, Jax, who has a really interesting um, uh, sort of created last name, which I've just put in the chat. Uh, I pasted it for you again because you came in after the first time I pasted it. Um, and we're just learning that it means uh, daughter of love in Gaelic, which is super cool. Um, Jax is really interested in the NeoBooks project. It seems to have grasped it despite our strange meandering uh, and scant writings about it on the outside world, uh, which I'm trying to improve. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, Jax, if you want to say a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Jerry, and nice introduction. And it's really, it's really um, lovely to meet you all and and to be here today. Um, so I'm from Australia. If you haven't picked up from the accent and and what Jerry said, and you can just call me Jax. Don't worry about the tricky last name. Um, I have um, uh, I've been following some of Jerry's work for a couple of years now, and um, then we crossed paths in a LinkedIn conversation a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Jerry let me know about this group, and I'm quite curious about it. I am um, a uh, I live and work in Australia. I'm um, uh, I'm a creative person, but I also work in the professions, so um, especially around the people professions. And I'm really exploring sort of the work, the role of imagination, and good question asking, and and creativity in some um, as we sort of tackle some of the big challenges in the world. Um, so. That's how I sort of, and I've been a mind map um, explorer. I haven't, um, I'm a bit of a dabbler there. And I've, um, uh, and I've had a bit of a go at your, um, uh, um, an the exercise brain. working through today. Yes, oh, that's right. right. The, the Neo Books Pop. The Neo Books Pop, which sounds interesting. So I'm interested in, in some of those different ways of, um, of creating and, and expressing in the world and, and, I'm very future sort of focused. I look at how we, um, my 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 real you know, sort of interest is in around how we how we have that long term thinking in a way that might uh, help us make really good choices now. So I've been tapping into all sorts of different um, ideas and philosophies around the world to try and understand just for my own uh, sense what that long term thinking might have uh, as an impact, a, a positive impact on us. That's so, lovely. Uh, yeah, so it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's it's lovely and it's very resonant with what we're all trying to do. And uh, it's it's funny. Um, uh, Jose's uh, worldview aligns really nicely with what you were just saying. Uh, Klaus is uh, very focused on food, the food industry, and the effects of food on our world. But along the same lines of what you just said, and <clears throat> I think Klaus had a career. Uh, enlightenment some years ago where he was like oh my gosh the food system as it currently exists is actually harming us and there's the, pos the prospects possibilities of flipping that around so that it actually hurt, helps us and, and fixes things so he's re really laser focused on that uh, and what's funny is we had four pop submissions and three of the four people are the people who've shown up for this call which is fabulous um so it'd be fun I, you know fun to go into that but first i just want to make room for klaus and jose if you want to uh say anything or introduce yourself briefly or something like that.
Go ahead, Klaus. No, you go ahead, Jose. <laughs> no, 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 you. No, you uh, could. <laughs> you no, no, you were you were here much before I was. Um, go ahead. Yeah, it, it's a pleasure meeting you. So um, I've been traveling with the OGM Group for quite a long time, right? I mean, it's pretty much since the inception. Yeah. Um, and and I'm the foodie in the group, you know. So I'm I'm like laser focused on food systems and my background, I spent a lifetime in the food service industry, actually starting as a chef, if you can believe that. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think um, food is is foundational, obviously, you know, it's at the very base of the pyramid of needs. And it's in far more peril than people realize. You know? So when you look at how climate change is already disrupting regions. You know, when you see uh, you know, broad, uh, uh, fires and uh, flooding and storms and so on, I mean, we all start stay fascinated at cars floating down the street, but what we don't pay attention to are the thousands of acres of farmland that are being flooded or burned down or dried out, you know? And so the, the uh, uh, the risk inherent in in that is is very profound. So that's sort of my my focus to bring attention to that. Super cool. Uh, Jax, you're muted. Yeah, yeah sorry, just uh, so it never gets old. That one does it. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, sounds fascinating, um, Klaus. And are you particularly uh, interested in that kind of emergency aspect of it? Are you looking at, uh, are you, is that your, is it your thing or is it you're looking at the sort of sustainability or the, um, this, the whole system? I'm looking at this from a meta level systems perspective. <clears throat> so I'm working, in fact, I just had a meeting this morning with Jean Ballinger, who is sort of a systems design guru. Um, and uh, the, 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 the difficulty here, the complexity here is that uh, food is you know, a multi-trillion dollar part of the global economy. Uh, it's incredibly complex. There are so many moving parts and you can't change any of them without changing everything. It's like a clockwork, you know. So you take any of those little screws out you, because you think it's too big or too small and then, and then want to insert you know, a different size. And guess what? The old clocks that just stopped. Now, um, so so the 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 uh, food system is really a finely tuned mechanism you know, that works just like that. And if you need to change that one wheel, you know, but that's destroying our soil microbiome and uh, needs to be you know changed out. Then you now that engages you now the supply chain. It's it engages the aggregators. Uh, the storage capacity for different types of grain, the processes, you know, because milling capacity needs to be adapted and adjusted for different grains and different legumes and so on. So it, the entire system down to the consumer from, from farm to market to consumers who need to engage and be willing to change their diets and adapt their, their uh, uh, consumption patterns uh, so that's sort of where I'm at. So I'm looking at this from an umbrella, uh, and it's called Innovations Brokerage, you know, where we're brokering relationships between what I call the coalition of the willing, you know, to find people who from farm to market are willing to engage here. That's a that's um deeply important work and and I and it's so, something um uh, yeah, I wonder with that, because people don't probably pay a lot of attention to it. They really just what, drive to their McDonald's and buy something and, and have no idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That is amazing. That's amazing. What, what, um, that's significant work. I, I, I'd love to know a little bit more about it as time goes on, Klaus. It's absolutely important. Um, Klaus is also working very closely with ChatGPT and a bunch oh. of other people in our communities, but he's also, um, uh, among all of us, that's a, kind of the best experimenter with it to generate prose that matters and flesh out his ideas and all that kind of thing. So it's it's been really interesting to watch him explore wow. that and share it with us and, and so forth as we go. 
Oh, great. Well, we've got a bit of an overlap there too. And when you're talking about that systems uh, approach there, I had was running a little bit in the back of my mind about how something like ChatGPT in that in a systems way is um, looking at the education area. If you take, if you start bringing in or you change the way that something happens with ChatGPT in a school, for example, then it actually has all these other follow-on effects all the way through too. So uh, it's, yeah, in, interesting, and I love the fact that you're writing in it. Um, that sounds great. Thank you. Cool. Wonderful to meet you, hear that. Jose, do you want to jump in? Yeah, so uh, my name is Jose Lia. I was actually born in Portugal and raised here in the States and um, and lived in Canada for 25 years. And I've been working in um the space of the future of work, which is basically trying to figure out how we change um, the way organizations are formed, created, operate, um, and its impact on humans and society as a whole. So, um, Joe's A. <laughs> I just couldn't help that. It was just like a, it was a layup. I put in the chat, um, Jax. Um, go ahead. Yeah, Jerry just recently discovered that because I'm Portuguese, you don't actually pronounce it as Jose, even though I that's fine. That's what that's I how you've by. defaulted. Yeah, but um, but yeah, in, in Portuguese, it's actually José. Um, so it's it's more and so the Ju, so the O should be more like a Ju. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm mispronouncing almost. It yeah, 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 yeah. You are, but that's okay. Well, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I want to get it right. Yeah, I, I do. I too. figure. I figure Neo books can be one little corner of the world where your name is pronounced the way you were born. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you the story about my last name and how, how long that um, for 50 years, I didn't realize my last name was what it had originally been. Oh yeah. So um, anyway, okay, uh, now, so now I kind of want to hear that story, but first where are you going? Yeah. So uh, basically um, designing organizations as collaboratives, which is um, co-owned, co-managed groups of individuals working in, in a peer-to-peer -peer based uh, way of, um, of operating uh, in an ecosystem of peer groups. Uh, so organizations that support and work with one another within that. Um, we're mostly, uh, we've piloted some of that in normal organizations hasn't gone too well. And so we've been working with co-ops and that's going much better. Uh, co-ops already has the right mindset and ethos and so forth. Uh, we co-wrote a book called Radical Companies, which was sort of the starting of this of this process. And, um, and as of late, we've been uh, working on a book called Serving Life. And it was that in uh, relationship with Neo Books that that brought me here, and so the idea is, um, how do we tell the story of um, of the reason we're here is to serve life, and we've created much of the mess that we've created is because we've lost sight of that, mm -hmm. and so how do we refocus our work? And I think all of our work. Uh, how do we refocus it on um, the need of life for us to rethink about it and do things to serve it? And so a lot of that has to do with uh, human needs. So we did some work on that as well and uh, and gone down that process. Wow. So, pleasure to meet you. That's in, that's impressive work. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, and uh, uh, thank you. Now you've, now you've confused me. <laughs> um, how do you prefer? Is that Jose? That's fine. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Jose, well, I, I'm following Jerry's. We'll have that conversation, but please don't. Um, I will. I, I like to get people's names right. Just takes me a few times sometimes. Um, at first, um, that is a um, that you you clearly have spent a lot of time thinking very deeply about this. It's impressive. Um, yeah. That that just the. Um, uh, the reason we're here in you know thinking in a work and context to serve life um, uh, it's lovely and refreshing actually um, and the co-op system um, it makes sense to me too that you've you know you've found a 
place there that people's are, are people are already receptive they've already done some of that work and it sounds like it's a bit of a step leap for other right. companies or organizations to to get there um I imagine though once you start putting these ideas out especially because there's so much frustration in the world about work and uh you know it seemed you know uh, watching how that very long bow from um industrial industrialism and through to where we are now, people sort of go, well, hang on, how do we end up in this office for 10 yeah. hours a day? What's it, what is all this about? So um, uh, fantastic. I will look up, what was the book called? I there? put it in the chat. Jerry oh, put great. it in the chat. Oh, great. Thank you. I'll have a look at that. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm going to tell you the story about my name. Yay. Yay. So so uh, a few years ago, I'm in, in Portugal, in the Azores, um, in the village that I was born in. Um, and said to my sister, I, I should be able to get my Portuguese paperwork, right? I, I've not dealt with that. I should do it. She's like, oh, yeah, sure. Let's go to the government office. So it turns out the government office is one room. Um, <laughs> and uh, and there's this lady there in this desk. I don't know if you've been to Europe much, but they have sort of the minimalist offices in Europe. And so you walk in and there's this desk in the middle of this room. It's not in the corner. It's not, it's like in the middle of this room. So walk up to her and I said, you know, here's my, all of my um, passports and IDs and everything. And um, I was born here. I want to see if I can get my things. She's like, if you were born here, of course, you know, no problem. You're, you're a citizen. Um, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Because when I went to the States, they said, you know, you have to give it up. You've given up all of your other citizenships and all of this stuff. You're an American now and so on and so forth. Um, and that stuck in my head because I was a kid when when I became an American citizen. And uh, so I said that. She's like, absolutely not. You will always be Portuguese. Here's your, you know, let's do this for you right now. She got all excited about it and searched me, gave her all the all of my data. And she said, I can't find you. You sure you were born here in this village? And I said, absolutely. My mom said I was born like in that building over there on the third floor, blah, blah, blah. And just, yeah, I can't find you. You know what? Sometimes parents don't remember things exactly. So let's look the whole island. Nope. Can't find you in the island. You're sure you're born in this island? Well, I know I lived in the other island as well, but I was pretty sure I was born here. So let's search all the islands. Nope. Can't find you. Wow. All right. Um, um, hmm. Let me do a, just a global search, Portugal wide. No, can't find you. So I'm like, um, all right. She says, all right. I'm going to have to send it back to the archives. It's going to take a few minutes. The archives is going to take like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And uh, you're going to have to wait. Of course, nobody else is in there. So we're just chatting for 20 minutes. And then she gets a message back. Found you in the archives. Oh, they, they, she had asked, well, your parents' grand name, you know, your parents' names and all of this stuff. So it turns out that even though I'm Jose Leal here in the United States, that was an accident of American policy, which was at the border, they took my dad's last name and applied it to the whole family. So my mom was a Cabral back in Portugal, her family name. Um, it became Leal. I always knew my mom as Leal, so I never thought about it, right? Um, turns out my dad had assigned to the kids his mother's maiden name, not his last name, because his mother's maiden name uh, was uh, De Serpa, and De Serpa was this all highfalutin, last name from from uh, an era gone by and it was much nicer than leal uh so uh even though he had leal because that's what his parents did to him wow. so, so i now carry uh two two ids with two different names oh wow um and whenever any government either government asks me if i have an alias i have mm -hmm. to divulge my alias um to, to both parties, which is kind of funny because it, it seems wrong. Like, it's like, do you have an alias? Yes, I have an alias. I shouldn't say that. But yeah, yeah. So anyway, and, that's the story. And does Leal mean loyal? Like it seems It to... does. It okay. does. It's actually appeared uh, during the time of the displacement of uh, Jews in Portugal. Um, and so it's thought to have been a Jewish family that converted. 
Interesting. So Sephardim turned into Leal. That's so mm -hmm. interesting. That the mm -hmm. whole expulsion of the Arabs and mm -hmm. Muslims and Jews from Spain is like this traumatic, fascinating event <clears throat> that caused a bunch of things in the world. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, so that's the uh, that's the that's the name story. That's really cool. So call me any one of those things. <laughs> Everything applies. Jose, Jose, Leal, Yo, yo De Serpo. <laughs> De Serpa. De Serpa, sorry. Oh, Jose, my goodness, that is a fascinating story. And can I just can I just ask you, um, when you were in that room and you were going through that experience, what was the what was the emotion you were feeling? Did you do you do you remember that? Was it to be honest, I was kind of a, a, a bit excited about the process because it was like, I never thought about, of course, I'm Portuguese, you know, but never from a citizen perspective, because it was like, I grew up here. I was uh, an American and then a Canadian, by the way. So mm -hmm. I, I hold three, three citizenships. And, um, but, but it was sort of like, never thought about it, never kind of thing. So when the idea came up, it was kind of like, yeah, let's go do this. This is fun. But when I couldn't be found, mm -hmm. then I started like questioning everything because I had spent a year with my mom after her stroke mm. and found out a lot of stuff about our family. You know, uh, my dad had passed. And so she started divulging all kinds of family secrets and stuff. So I started thinking, oh, it's more complex than all the stuff she's even told me. <laughs> maybe I'm not, you know, maybe I'm not theirs. Maybe I was adopted. I don't know. You know, your head starts going, what the hell? Like all the different options, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, a good question because it did, it did definitely was kind of weird. I started joking with my sister and the, and the lady. It's like, no, no, I'm, the lady was very much like, Calm down there. It's okay. It'll be okay. Gonna... It'll be okay. We'll find you. <laughs> We've seen this before. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. They they see it before. She told yeah. the story about how often people come back and like trying to figure out who the families were, but like generationally speaking, like not firstborn, you know, like having been born there like myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but people that came back like two or three generations later and are trying to find family and stuff like that and and see if they could, because my grandfather was from Portugal, could I get citizenship and stuff like that, you know? So it's yeah. really complex, she was saying. Mm. So. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. It's a wonderful story. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Mm. Uh, two, two tiny subnotes from me. Uh, one is all my elders from my branch are dead and I have no kids. So I'm kind of the, the end of my little branch. But one of the mistakes both sides of the family did were never telling me the stories that you got, got to hear firsthand. And so I've been doing some detective work and uncovering a whole mess of stuff that I like, oh, oh, okay, so that's what happened. But they never really, my advice to families is if there's hard stuff in your family history, like share it out. You You, you want to help your kids not repeat those things. And one of the ways they can not repeat them is to learn the lessons, you know, to get fed the lessons. But you also gain a really good understanding of why your family is the way it is, right? Because yeah, it's exactly right. There's so much of subtle influence on people's lives that they themselves may not know, right? right? For them, it's just sort of a story to tell. Like in my mom's case, like, oh, this happened and that happened and that happened. And it's like, Wow, no wonder you're as screwed up as you are. You know, it's like, it's like she she doesn't think that, right? She just thinks exactly. You know, exactly. It's crazy. Uh, Absolutely and, crazy. And then the second note is I've applied for German uh citizenship. Hmm, so, so you're one of those. We're, we're coming up on a year since the application, and they said it might take two years to find out. I'm like, wait, you're Germans? How can it take two years? Um, but uh, but having an EU citizenship might be really useful. So we're excited about that. If the Germans don't allow dual citizenship, you will have to give up your U.S. citizenship. As I understand it, um, it's it, it, they changed the the laws in in uh, 2021, and I can hold both. That's my current understanding. Okay, so yeah, 2021 is something new because when I came back, I had to give up my German citizenship uh, when I took on my U.S. citizenship, and when this uh, German company brought me back in, mm -hmm. I was working with an immigration lawyer. Um, and he was able to get me a, an unconstrained, unlimited work permit 
uh, until the age 65 at the time. Um, but he goes, there's, no, there's like zero chance for you to get your citizenship back, which I wanted because of my kids, you know. Um, but no, they're, they're, they're very limited on that. They make some rare exceptions, um, but uh, that was pretty rough. So a, a quick Google search gives the both U.S. and Germany permit dual citizenship now, apparently. Ah, see, my kids missed out on that one. Are they it's not too late. Yeah, they, 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 they could apply. Mm -hmm. uh, and might recommend doing so because could come in super handy. I mean, if they wanted to work for an extended period in, in, in Europe, anywhere in the EU, done. Yeah, but this is this says child, it does it doesn't say children born to two Americans who there's lots of there's lots of different I mean I think the important yeah. statement is the first sentence. So if I hadn't given up my German citizenship to become a US citizen, yes, that would have worked. Right. I did when I became a US citizen, I'm no longer German. So this wouldn't apply. Yeah. Mm. That'd be worth exploring. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah that's really... that's what I thought too, uh, Klaus. Uh, and it was very different for me. So, well, Germany is like one of the very very few countries that have this uh, single citizenship rule. I mean, Switzerland, Austria, Australia. I mean, Austria. Uh, I mean, everybody is Canada. They all allow dual citizenship. Now. So I I found a good page uh, on the German visa, germanyvisa.org, which I don't think is the German government, but uh, it helps. So June 2024, new citizenship laws. Hmm. That's pretty recent, more recent than my application. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, they may need... Uh to open up immigration a little bit, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. Well, thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, those are all preambles to our activity here, but really fun. And, and I'm, I'm happy, Jax, that your presence here kind of stimulated uh, this conversation. Um, uh, any other thoughts, comments before we dive into popping? No, well, let's pop it up. Let's pop. Sounds great. Uh, I'm going to screen share the spreadsheet for a sec. Bink, bink. So here are the replies that came in for the form, which uh, I will we will continue to sort of promote into the OGM list or whatever. Um, I think I'll, after this call, I'll report back on on how it went uh, and uh, let people know that they can keep doing this because I would love to see more of these. Uh, so George is not here, and his uh, the post he he put in is just a post on X, which he's already posted. Um, so it's a brief, uh, it's a it's a tweet, and um, it would be easy for us to um, retweet it or to draw attention to it or whatever. We can come back to that. Um, and if we have any feedback for George, if you want to take a look at it and have any feedback, we can send him the the recording to this call, and he could get that, or we can wait until he might be able to attend here. Uh, but he's an he's an old friend and a and a big systems thinker, and so it's cool that he liked the idea and submitted something. Um, yeah, I spent and, uh, I spent a few days with George at his place uh, last oh, year. Oh wow! Actually, yeah. but just last year. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, do you do, cool. do you have the link to that page? So uh, so okay. the link is right here in the in the spreadsheet. Let me just copy it into into the chat. Uh, and let, I. And hold on, I'll also paste a link to, I'm screen sharing, so my chat is over here. Um, I'll also paste the link to the spreadsheet in the chat. Uh, so you all can join me there. <clears throat> um, cool, and I pasted a link to the spreadsheet in the Mattermost channel, so it's there as well earlier today before the call. Uh, then Jose, uh, Jose, I have to retrain myself again. <laughs> Jose. 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 Not Ooh. Jose. Jose. Oh, perfect. Jose. Okay, good. Well, the weird thing, so I speak fluent Spanish. Spanish has five vowel sounds and only five vowel sounds. A, E, I, O, U. 
Portuguese, on the other hand, really messes with Spanish speaking people's brains because I don't know how many vowel sounds they have, but it's many, 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 many. And all the A's and O's and U's are like, oh, yeah. there's like this. We like thing. diversity. You do, apparently. So English has 23 vowel sounds. If you count the diphthongs, I only know this because in drama class in undergrad, they had us memorize fi fa 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 fu fa 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 foi fur fa fa something else that that basically uses the letter f and goes through all the English vowel sounds. My best advice to Spanish speakers trying to learn English is to focus on that. If they can, if they can, if they can master the fact that vowels are just like this this terrible fire swamp. That they that they need to drill, then their English will sound much better. Anyway, um, sorry for the digression. Uh, so we have uh, we have here three pieces. Uh, they're they're uh, I think Klaus's is the longest, but collaborative knowledge from uh, José. Uh, I, I'm trying to get closer. Uh, that's how we got onto this digression again. Uh, <laughs> Worldviews from Klaus, and then Jax's LinkedIn post about long term thinking. Um, and it's up to you all to point in the direction you'd like to go. Um, so my, my first question is how, um, how serious were you about, um, focusing on the election? Oh, good point. Uh, because we are, we have not so much focused on the election here, although, uh, George did, but it's very brief. Uh, we're sort of doing broad systems thinking. And thank you for reminding me of that because I keep forgetting that actually in this in this project. I would love to do that. I would also love to have a couple of things that we do together so that we get a feeling for what this is and 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 repost. But I, I would like a lot uh, to to keep us on track for thinking about the election cycle, the current through November. So um, good, good, good question. Well, not because I like it, um, personally. I'm not a fan of dealing with the politics part. Um, but uh, but if that's if that's your focus, then um, maybe you know we just pick those and and keep running with those until. So I think I think all that does for me is anything that shows up that's very election related should bump to the top of our queue. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't deal with other stuff because we want to figure out what this is and how to do it better. So let's, you know, let, let's not ignore posts that aren't relevant to the election just because there's a guideline. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be a, a guideline or, in, or a, a, a focusing statement, not a rule. One of the things I can't stand about Trump, among the many, are that he has gotten part where he is partly by breaking norms. And I hate it when we turn norms into laws or rules. I, I, I prefer norms. I think norms are excellent. And I think more of society should run on social agreements, social norms, other kinds of things that we enforce as communities. Um, and so the idea that, well, all candidates until now have shared all their tax information before the election, he was like, oh, I'll do that. No, I'm not gonna do that. And then he didn't. And then they had to be sued out of him and I'm like, wow, okay. And, and that's just one of the many, many, many norm cities that he's torn, which by itself could be a post that could be submitted to a neo pop, neo book pop. Yeah, uh, I actually did uh, turn this into, into a book. I mean, a neo book, um, because I, ju I just, I mean, this is such an existential uh, decision uh, for the for the country to make to to let this guy. Um, I mean, to, it's not about Trump; it's about the people he brings in. You know, it's about the cabinet that he. You have Stephen Miller. You know, maybe she chief of staff or mm -hmm. be the AG. I mean, the most insane people mm -hmm. that uh, would come into office, and I'm tracking this somewhat closer because you know I'm I'm engaged in the farm bill and so I've been following the farm bill negotiations and the the Trump side of the equation meaning the Republicans who are betting on Trump you know to clear to clear the path are basically wanting to take every reference to climate change out of the farm bill mm -hmm. so so there is so much money allocated towards 
what they call climate smart activities, you know, putting in cover crops, putting in uh, you know, rotating crops and things of that sort, and, and shifting the incentive system from within the farm bill. And we're talking about billions and billions of dollars, right? I mean, that's a fire hose of incentives, uh, shifting those out of commodity crops, you know, soy, corn, and wheat, and and, and moving that into a more decentralized uh, approach where you have, where you regionalize the food system, break it down into bioregions and stimulate the recovery of bioregions. And so if Trump was to come into office, there is already a guy lining up to become the next secretary of agriculture who is already determined you know, to hold back all these efforts that have been made. So I'm I'm like have a really close look at the implications of this election, which is why I mean just from from my slice of the economy that's being impacted, it's unfathomable you know, for us to do this because I mean, it's it's just so dangerous. We we are uh, really in at a in in a uh, I mean this is like. Uh, uh, a fire, you know, to 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 uh, uh, to do what we should have started doing ten years ago. Um, we seem to have slipped right into our discussion about your post, which is good because it is about Trump, etc. Are we okay with that? Should we keep going? Sounds fine. So, so this year, I this this last nugget that I wrote was stimulated by a conversation I had on LinkedIn. Every once in a while, I love to poke the Christian perspectives, you know? And so I, I uh, got into a conversation with this guy basically saying, I mean, how do you align, you know, supporting Trump with these clear mandates that you find in the New Testament? And the guy came back with a response that I thought was really alarming. No, because it disclosed a mind, a deep, a, a mindset that was sort of inoculated against what I was saying, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I I followed, and and of course I'm having these conversations with my GPT, which is you now specifically trained uh, for for these kinds of conversations. Um, and then when, so when you scroll down, uh, you can you, you know I'm asking it. Uh, the question, um, um, where was this? Is, is this? Oh no, you have to go. I'm sorry, you have to. I'm in a different. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm in a different chapter here. So I'm asking it. Um, where am I here? So the first, the first question was. You know, stimulating you know, research current MAGA movements uh, and its plans for the election. Um, sorry, where the hell am I? I'm not in the. I think you're in a different document. Yeah, we're in worldviews, the war of ideas. Oh yeah, so you know, I made a point that the teachings of Christ are rooted in love, and that should not be, blah blah blah. So, um, so the, the this somewhat delusional worldview, a fantasy world that is being manipulated by orange, which is the orange worldview, um, which is basically Trump, uh, could create a global crisis. You know, there's a great deal of passion. So the the uh, GPT then comes back and says, yeah, indeed, uh, this could lead to broader societal and global consequences. Then it breaks it down into. Um, you know, manipulation and delusional worldview, passion and potential for violence, statement and global stalemate and global consequences. And then I had also instructed it to do a research run on this question. And it comes up you now there's psychological manipulation. Uh, research in political psychology suggests that leaders who can tap into a deep seated fears and beliefs can create a loyal and motivated following an impact and polarization, climate change urgency. So it and it, it, the, the the AI is coming, your assessment is well founded now. Um, and I'm using these conversations with AI to challenge me, right? So I'm putting forth a hypothesis and I said, do you agree with that? You know? 
and quite often it comes back and 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 modifies uh, my my question and saying not quite but here and so in this case it agrees with uh, what i'm saying so Klaus, one one piece of feedback from me, I don't know if everybody else agrees, is it is unclear from me from a quick read of this that this first section here is your prompt and that the rest of this is from ChatGPT. And if I were you, just to make really clear of that, I would put a heading up here that says my prompt and then ChatGPT colon at the beginning of each of the ChatGPT replies because it's just not it's not obvious to a person, if you read the text, then you say the response you received in LinkedIn, you, and if you know about ChatGPT, you'd be like, oh, this sounds like ChatGPT answering. Uh, but you know, you, yeah, you can say Klaus's question. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then GPT's reply or something something like that. But it, just labeling this makes it much, much easier to parse and understand yeah. uh, what the roles are in this piece. Yeah, and then this here is the... Uh... Is the GPT that image it created? No. Yeah. So, so add in Chat GPT's reply either above above the image or below the image. I don't know which. Uh, so you're asking it to generate an image to go with each reply. Yeah. I mean, that's the GPT here. Cool. So yeah, GPT's reply or something just to be parallel with your. So I'm I'm asking that. the GPT here. Um, I, I mean. I, 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 I know what you're doing. I'm just I'm just uh, recommending this as a as a clarifier for readers. Yeah. So so uh, but anyway, coming back to to what it says, um, um, this prepare for the comeback of of uh, I mean Luke six twenty two. Blessed are you when men shall hate you. And I mean that I found that's just totally alarming that this guy would say get get ready for the comeback of Trump and here's this biblical reference of how to substantiate that. So is he inaccurate in his biblical citation? Well, this is actually the last uh, paragraph of the Beatitudes, which are talking about blessed are the poor, right? Right. And so to turn that into um, blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall re shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake, right? So so the, the mindset that drives this here is that um, you're actually blessed if hate is coming towards you, which completely inoculates you from any conversation that would, dis would be in disagreement with you, right? So that's what I found so alarming here. Um, so, that, so I asked the GPT, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's a, uh, and then the GPT is saying it reflects a mindset that is shaped by a particular interpretation of Christian teaching, you know, one that might fuel current or future societal opposition as a sign of righteousness and divine approval. Yeah? And so it comes down uh, 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 you know, to, to so, so it, it says, yeah, this is really a, a, a bad thing. And so then I'm saying, so with this somewhat delusional worldview, that's a fantasy world that is being manipulated by a higher level of cognition, orange, uh, but that could create a global crisis. I mean, that is a great deal of passion uh, that energizes uh, 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 and could end up in violence. My assumption is that this worldview being manipulated is red and blue. You know, that's so, so these are lower level uh, cognitive stages um and now we went through spiral dynamics and all of this and it says yeah your assessment touches on a complex and potentially volatile situation where political and religious religious beliefs intertwine with intense emotions potentially leading to broader societal and global consequences so that that's really um uh, and I mean, when you go into, you know, and I spent, as, as you know, I spent several years uh, in the evangelical uh, movement. Uh, so I'm quite familiar with, with these, these argumentations. Um, and so uh, what, what is this? These are, these are munici uh, municipalities at war, you know? And, and so the, the ideas, and this is in Revelations, I mean, the ideas, that drive you know, our worldviews and opinions uh, uh, can completely control our behavior.
Um, so, so two things, and then I'd love to pass it to Jackson, uh, José, José. Um, uh, one is, I really like your point about inoculation, and this is in fact a, a feature of cult membership, is that uh, people are inoculated to all the things others might say, to say, oh, you're in a cult, oh, you're whatever, you're whatever. They all have handy, handy references that they can point to and say, well, no, this. So um, I think that point you made is really interesting and it's not in the write-up here. So it, optionally, if you if you added that, it would add color and depth to what you're writing. Then the second point is, and this is one of my problems with the Bible, um, the Bible is replete um, up to the gills with phrases, parables, anecdotes, stories, morals that can be uh, framed and reframed and phrased and rephrased and interpreted in just about any way you want. And that irritates me no end. <laughs> it irritates me just absolutely no end because he's actually quoting the Bible, right? Whereas people will do defensively and he's taking it out of context from the Beatitude. What, well, I don't fully understand its context, but, but there's an interesting other discussion here about that, which had probably has no place in this essay, but is, 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 is a personal interest to me. It's like, man, what I see with, you know, the evangelicals love affair with Trump is that there is so much, backbending and and you know uh, sort of uh, creative use of language going on to justify these things because I think that these people are being unchristian in the most unchristian of ways. And there, there's almost no way to prove that using the Bible because the Bible is so bendy and, and flexible in, in, in this way. And I don't know if you agree with that, but um, I, I have not yet to meet anybody who thinks that there's a single interpretation to each parable in the Bible or whatever. Like that never happens. It's always like, oh, actually, the real message of this the, of this passage is this. And I'm like, wait, what? Where did that come from? So, yeah, I mean, the the, the Bible has to be understood first of all at a at a meta level, right? And and when you when you look at the teachings of Christ, I mean. I mean, the, the the entire New Testament is really uh, based on you have to in, you have to include empathy into your into your process into your thinking if you want to have a functioning society and a future for mankind. That's basically what it boils down to. And then it goes into and, and it pays great attention to uh, you know how you. How your society functions can be seen on the way you treat the poor and the and the disadvantaged, right? Because that's a reflection of all the policies and all the thinkings that you have put in motion. That's where that's that's who you are. And so, in in, in Jesus describes it is by what you do to the least of them, you do to me, right? So, so that when you when you look at this overhead structure of 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 what the Bible. Uh, what what the New Testament specifically really stands for, then you have to if, then you have to read each one of these the, these texts in view of that, right? And so and and what the particularly Catholic Church is doing is wringing all kinds of nonsense out of individual chapters and or or texts that have no relation to the to the core, right? And you. And so, so it's like a tree. I mean, Jesus actually uses the example of a tree, right? The roots of the tree and the branches and so on. And, and yeah, so, and if a branch dies, you know, you, you cut it off and burn it. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to be theological here. Oh, it's okay, we're, we're going there. So, uh, Jax, any thoughts? Um, yeah, look, that, um, thank you, um, Klaus, for for uh, sharing this and also for explaining uh, that I am, um, uh, I, I um, it's really, yeah, I think the Jerry's suggestion there with the, with the signposting is helpful for that context. And just listening to you talk at the piece that I would love to see uh, more of this is that discussion about um, that interpretation and uh, even at the end, even at the end, if you're able to, you know, you've got the questions and then the GPT response, what struck me as really um, useful in there is your understanding of how that GPT, you said, usually it challenges me. It usually says this wasn't 
uh, oh, actually, I have you thought about it from this perspective, but in this case, it's actually gone you know, and agreeing. And why it's, a, why it's agreeing with you is because it's reaching back through all of that digital library and it's finding X amount of instances that make what, you, um, make what it's saying make sense. And, and that is because in humanity and all that amount of writing that's gone up and been digitised, the precedence, the precedent for this type and um, the GPT's response is there. So there's a, a bit of exploration there, um, you know, as well as the theological explanation, but it's also there's this is tapping back into a lot of knowledge. And I um you articulated it beautifully when you were talking through. So I think there's room after after this, what you've got is actually to unpack a little bit further what your um your thought process around this is, which is um you know, really interesting. Cool. How's that landed? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's always a challenge because, um, I mean, the reason I'm packing it into a neo book is that uh, as the chip, as the chapters, I mean, the nuggets flow, right? So if if you look at one freestanding nugget, then that's a little bit more difficult to break down, but when you see it in the flow of uh, the the book itself, you see the conversation unfold. Uh, so the context starts to become, uh, the context is already built in. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, that makes sense. Um, uh, I, I guess the other thing too, just thinking that through that is um, the your comment about that empathy in that future thinking area and that's probably um something else just in terms of that argument to pull through which is um around how you might um what's what recommendations even the gpt might have for um for changing or to challenge somebody's perception when they have this very um baked in um use of the bible to justify their um, you know, sort of fairly delusional thinking. So I wonder, um, as you go through thinking about what the, what the solution, what is the solution? What is the solution? I don't know, but um, there might be something there as you as you, you know, explore this in terms of what um, what what suggestions the GPT has there. You're probably into that, though, I reckon. That is more difficult to get out. Uh, the the, the the uh, AI is not really good at, at making connections like that. You know, I think GPT-5, when they come out with version 5, that's actually the, the, the quantum leap from 4 to 5, is that it can build these kinds of, of relationships and connections. It, but the, what you're limited to right now is that I'm making these connections as a hypothesis, feed it to it, it then stitches it and goes, yeah, that works. Or no, that doesn't work. But it it can't do it on its own. So that's that's the problem. I stimulated the conversation. There is one when you look at uh, uh, one Corinthian thirteen um, is is not one central uh, uh, a part of the Bible, one central uh, paragraph in the Bible, and one Corinthians thirteen basically is a total repudiation of someone like Trump. Because what it says, if you don't have love, you're just an empty symbol. You you like you're gone. You know you can be as successful as you want. You can you can move mountains. You know you can conquer nations. But if you don't have love in your heart, you're nothing to me, God. Right. So so when you when you say that, and then you ask a question, so how do you how do you put that together? There's nothing you can say. You know that would that would challenge this because the next step then is you get, either you are a Christian, either you you are telling me that everything in the Bible is true and real. So if that is true and real, then how does that fit into it? It doesn't, right? And so that's when and this is what I actually did. I used one Corinthians thirteen, uh, saying so. How do you how do you square this? You know, and then this person came back to me with with this hate message there. Right. So, so, so that that and it's actually, I mean, it's the best focus group research you can do on the you know on on social media if you prompt the people like this and see how they re respond to it. Yeah, highly manipulative, isn't it? Mm. Indeed. 
Um, what you say? I was listening to what you were saying and uh, Jerry, and uh, it made me think, is there <clears throat> a text anywhere that isn't manipulated in the way that you just described the Bible to be? Um, the U.S. Constitution, there seems to be a thousand different variants of every single there aren't variants thing. of it there are different interpretations for sure yeah yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. you get the originalist or textualist versus constructivist kind of arguments around around the constitution that happens as long as those serve <laughs> you in the moment exactly exactly and but, then but, when they stop serving you in the moment then you pick something else and you go with that but i'm but i think what i'm saying is that the bible is particularly reinterpretable and very spongy and flexy in this way. And, and uh, the, the Constitution has a bunch of places where there's contradictions, there's stuff that's left open. <clears throat> the word woman is not in the, in the Constitution once, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of really mixed up issues, but it's a relatively short document by comparison, and we can kind of duke it out on these things, where, where the Bible seems to me to be of a different nature. If I go back to the, to the yamas and the niyamas from Patanjali, which are the basis of yogic thinking, I don't know that there's, you know, uh, rabbinic commentary equivalent on those. There probably is, but they're really clear. And they're they're just very nice crystalline examples, like a parigraha, non-grasping. is like, here, this. And it, it, it's not ambiguous. It, it, you could still probably wrestle with it and say, well, what are you grasping and how? You could, you could go there. But it's mm -hmm. so much crisper. Mm -hmm. It's so much crisper. And it's not trying to be meta or analogous or metaphoric or anything like that. It's just like, here, this. But I guess what I'm getting at is, and I agree, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the Bible is is clear in any way, shape, or form. Um, but there is an underlying truth, I believe, which is that no matter what the written word is, in what format, in what style, and whatever. Our interpretation of it is done by us. And that interpretation is done by my context, not by the words that exist there, right? It's, well, it, it's the interaction of both. And somebody, well, else, somebody else is trying to create a force field. The interpretation is done by me. <clears throat> yeah, but somebody's right? trying to create and, a force field of ideas to in, influence your context. That's the reason they're doing some kind of bizarre argument. Some kind of so there so somebody trying to convince you of something by reinterpreting or misinterpreting something is trying to create a force field of ideas to change or warp your own context. So you you have a context that that precedes the thing you're about to read. It it sort of enters and then it's trying to mess with your context. So there's this battle, there's this interaction between your context, which is not stable over time. It will change. It's flexy. Um, and all the ideas you're willing to contemplate, which is why cults and other uh, other groups wall off other ideas. I, I, I remember a long time ago, I wound up in a conversation with a driver in Jordan, <laughs> and we finally got into a good conversation, finally, after a couple of days. And, and you know, it, it got to, you know, have you read the Bible? He's like, well, yes. And, and, and you know, have you read the Quran? Have you read, uh, you know, uh, other, other documents? Yes. And it turns out he hadn't read any of them, but the Quran, by definition, includes all books. And so once you've memorized the Quran, you don't need to read anything else. And I'm probably misinterpreting that, but that's what I heard him say. And I, and I was like, wow, what a good inoculation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. against any entering conversation. It's like, yeah, no, the, all wisdom is contained in the Quran. You don't need to reach out for any other stuff. Well, and we'll debate this one just like uh, Jews and Christians debate the Bible. We'll do the right. same. I guess what I was trying to get at has nothing to do with the Bible per se um, or Trump. It's that human condition is to believe what's my context. And if what the person or the statement resonates with my context, for whatever reason, and it doesn't have to be logical in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. but it resonates, um, 
then that's the resonance that I go with because that's the thing. And if I don't have a good skills of reevaluating that logically and, and questioning myself and my resonance, why am I resonating with that? Then I just go with it, right? And most of us go around going with what resonates with us and we don't do a good job of questioning our resonance. To me, that's a much more critical conversation to have because right now, half of the United States is resonating with that. Mm -hmm. And why it's resonating with it is much more important to me than the fact that they're resonating with that individual. Totally because right. something contextually is happening that is causing them to be in that resonant state. So what's their context that makes it real for them? And so part of why I don't like the politics angle is because the politics angle is just about us and them and, and you know, this guy versus that guy or gal. Um, how do we, how do we go to that proto thing, the thing that's creating that resonance? Mm -hmm. And, and to me, that conversation is one that is not being had because we're so focused on having the us versus them, the he versus her and the so on and so forth. So um, if we can go get to that conversation, I'd really love to, to have that conversation at some point with somebody, but, uh, but I'm not hearing that as, as a conversation that's being had. Um, would you be willing to sort of summarize that into a sentence or two, since, since you have a lot of interest on it and focus on it and put it someplace like on the Mattermost uh, Neobooks channel or if you, if you if it motivates you to do something bigger on you know on the OGM list or whatever, but just some place to remind us to do that because I think you'll find a lot of people are interested, and I'm certainly interested, and I can, we can make that a topic somewhere in in, in this process, uh, or that might motivate you to write about uh, you know to put an yeah. initial stake in the ground about uh, stake in the ground about the topic. Um, I want to go back to the the pop process. Please, first. thank you. Um, because we've gone we've gone quite deep into a you know a, a critique class of the things you raised. Um, partly, partly, I want us in popping to be kind of pragmatic about this and to offer some advice, but then also to do really pragmatic things like, hey, what what hashtag should be on this post, uh, so that it gets a little bit more attention as people scour hashtags and follow those around, and then at some point, once we should, sh you know, we should each think of what media we can use to re to retweet, repost, like, and otherwise do these things. Uh, Klaus, each of us has a preferred place to post ideas. Um, I'm doing a slightly too complicated thing now where I've started a Substack, but I'm going to I'm gonna take some of the Substack posts and, and post them on LinkedIn. I might also repost uh, most of them on Medium, although Medium I haven't posted on for a while, but it's it's got a different audience, another audience. And all of the things I'm writing like that, I'm actually creating on Pete's massive wiki. Um, Jack's Pete Kaminsky is kind of the, the Scotty data and Spock of OGM. That's how I describe him to people. He's kind of our geekiest member. Uh, he's been super fantastic of supporting us with, with technology and experiments and all kinds of other stuff. You'll see him on the OGM list. He was just posting some experiments with visualization of graphs and maps. Um, and he runs uh, a, a, a nascent wiki-ish platform he calls Massive Wiki, uh, which isn't quite a wiki yet, but it's it basically it it, uh, it it wikis have version control of every page, which we get by posting on GitHub because GitHub saves every change and it's it's great. Um, it, GitHub is also an open repository, so it's open for other visitors and other people to repurpose or you know suggest changes to. Uh, and then he's got a, a, a site builder, so you can cr actually create a website based on the pages you put on Massive Wiki. So I've been writing in Obsidian, which is the my preferred Markdown editor. Uh, other people like others, but I really like uh, Obsidian. Uh, I think there's one called Adam and a couple, you know, a bunch of others. Um, but I've been writing in Obsidian on Massive Wiki, and I then I then I grab that text and I copy it into Substack, copy it over here, copy it over there. So it's a bunch of manual labor to do all in the interest of getting a thought out into a variety of audiences, which was a very long explanation to say, I want to help us each get better reach by thinking about where does this go? Who else might repost it into their flows and which ones? And how do, how do we maximize the leverage of being here together and agreeing to uh, do a pop? 
which is the the word I'll use for this thunderclap like um, thing to get more attention for for everybody's work. Does that make sense to everybody? It's good. Um, and so and so when we're done with the piece, when we're done kind of reviewing it, whoever was the author of the piece should send the note back to us saying all changes, all suggestions are done, and whatever you decide to ignore is cool. But when you say you're done. And, and it's posted over here, and this is the permalink, then the rest of us should kick in and do our liking, uh, you know, reposting, whatever else we want to do, depending on the post. I mean, we're not asking anybody to do anything they don't agree with or, or don't want to do. We're just trying to create a place where there's a lot more attention for everybody's work. Is good? Okay. Um, cool. Uh, Klaus, any other thoughts about this piece? Um, partly what I was recommending with the headers is that you do that for all your writings because you're you're writing a lot with ChatGPT and you need to make it really, this is just my own thought, you need to make it very evident when you're speaking and when ChatGPT is speaking. Uh, otherwise, yeah. it's it's sort of confusing and a little bit misleading for people. Yep. Which is cool because the interplay is adds a, a meta dimension to the whole the whole exercise. I, I think it's it's it, that actually adds to it. Um, it's like you're living your own version of the movie Her, <laughs> without without falling in love with the chatbot. Yeah, well, you'd you never know. You never know. Yeah, it could still happen. I do get some um, some pretty incredible conversations out of this thing. But it's also amazingly frank in in saying, you know, we I don't have consciousness and I never will have consciousness because I'm driven by algorithms and and uh, uh, um, I'm basically machine thinking. So I can pretend that I uh, feel empathy, I can simulate empathy, but I can't I can't really sense it. No. The, the, my only counter argument to that is, if it does turn out that we are all living inside of a simulation then maybe what's happening here is GPT and LLMs and all that work is beginning to approximate the simulation and we're actually gonna meet in the middle and it turns out that that's how, that's how consciousness and empathy developed, which, I, which is not a theory I subscribe to. Um, no. But it's, but it's an interesting living, thought exercise. We are clearly living within a much larger model uh, which we are now just becoming aware of, right? Because the entire biosphere is alive. You know? So this the Gaia hypothesis was the first thing that really caught my attention because, of course, I mean, my God, it's a self-regulating system, right? Um, and when you have a self-regulating system at planetary scale, so, well, I mean, whatever intelligence drives this thing, whether that's static or whether it's uh, dynamic, we don't know. But there is clearly a much larger intelligence at play which we just barely fathom now. Now, in some religions, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, and so on, they have a better grasp on this uh, than the indigenous religions have sort of a more intuitive living with it. But we are now approaching it from a science perspective, you know, and then you realize, man, we really don't know a damn thing, right? <laughs> it's just like, it's just like crazy. So, so, and then you realize that you are, impacting this this system at meta level right where you are really forcing it to respond to you and that's really not what you want you don't want this thing to pay attention to you because then you don't know what it's going to do with you and so this is sort of the situation we're in right now agreed <laughs> apropos what you just said about gaia and and the energy um i've forgotten now what list it was on but i'm on a couple of lists that have a lot of scientists on them and I think they're sort of private lists, and I am not a scientist, but there, there was a really interesting conversation about consciousness. And the scientists on the list were basically doing a pretty reductionist scientific approach to consciousness, which I will paraphrase badly by saying, here's a neuron, here's another neuron. Suddenly you get a cluster of neurons and other things that magically springs into being conscious, a process we know almost nothing about. But, but, but they were assembling consciousness out of atomic parts. And so my friend Sunil, uh, who lives in Delhi, and just wrote, wrote a book titled uh, Yog AI, which is about the, com the, the intersection of yoga, yogic thinking and AI, um, he wrote a post onto the same thread that I don't know anybody sort of 
noticed or whatever, but I loved it. And I, I've had a conversation with him since then on, on Zoom. But his post was like, well, if you look at this from the Vedanta perspective, there's a completely inverse way of seeing this, which is that consciousness is the precursor, is the thing that is. And entities go up and sort of seize or inhabit a piece of that consciousness. And again, I'm probably paraphrasing him poorly here. Conscious uh, entities like us, like little humans, go up and inhabit a piece of that consciousness and, and, and change it for a while and then drop out of it. And it's not that we are materially assembling something that suddenly springs into consciousness. It's that we suddenly become part of consciousness and then we drop out of it. And that means that all kinds of entities might be participating in this consciousness. It means that panpsychism or whatever else doesn't sound unreasonable. It just sounds like different entities grab different amounts or parts of this consciousness, but that the consciousness is the precursor. And, and that's kind of a mind-blowing thing because it, it flips a lot of... I love thoughts like that because they, they flip a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to run off a little early because I have a 12 o'clock. I just need to pull some slides out for um cool. but yeah good conversation thanks Klaus. nice Morning. meeting you Jack. next monday thanks Klaus. Thank bye, Klaus. Right. Thank bye, bye. cool any other thoughts we, we've got 15 minutes left if we want but uh other thoughts uh um i, I, I want to hear um i want to have a look at uh jose's work um but I also think there's some, something interesting in that flipping that you're talking about there because essentially it means that some of the work, if you know, we go down that path, the work of science, the work of developing AI is actually us being assembled around a, a consciousness that this is the reason why it's coming to being, if you like. Um, mm. It's a really interesting idea. Mm. It is. And uh, Sunil is fun to talk to, so... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, very patient and, and, uh, he's worked on this book for the last two, three years. And he was in, in our, in our recent zoom, he was like, the, the work on this book really changed me. I feel like it, it really put me in a, in a new and different place. And it's very cool to see. Cool. It is cool. Thanks for sharing it. I've got it written down. Another book to look up. Yeah, I, I bought it. I've got it on my Kindle, but I haven't read enough of it. So I, I've got to sort of get into it. There, there's just too many things to read, and and uh, that brings, which brings me, Jose, to your lovely post, um, which is in the the queue here, which I think we should pick up sort of wholeheartedly next week. Um, despite the fact that it's not about the election, it, it's about how we sort of figure stuff out, and uh, literacy and, and and its effects and all those kinds of things. But um, yeah, we we can we can sort of pick it up uh, with more intention next week when we have more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of it is my still working out how do we define neobooks and mm -hmm. and what is uh, this concept. And for me, the idea of neobooks has been emerging without the terminology or, or a real understanding of a, a practical implementation of it but has been emerging for a number of years as this recognition that we've created information uh, that has been super helpful because it allowed us to dissem disseminate, disseminate language, or pardon me, uh, knowledge across the world in, in efficient ways that didn't exist before. Now we're doing so at such a scale that most of it is useless. It's hitting, it, most of it is hitting the wrong people at the wrong time in a sense that the messaging, the amount of messaging that we have um, in the form of books that aren't being read and the form of the tweets that aren't being, you know, understood or, or reused or utilized in any way. There's there's throwaways, right? Uh, we were we're using our energy to create information, whereas in the past that energy was very focused because it was so difficult to do. Mm -hmm. That it was a rare skill. It was a rare skill. It With was a very rare. small broadcast footprint. Right. Right. And so now, because the technology has allowed it, us to just proliferate knowledge everywhere, 
that it, the, the level of quality on both sides of the equation, both the creation of and the ingestion of um, has become. And so how do we think about that at that scale? Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that Neobooks is really a kind of recognition of that. That's my sense of it. Mm -hmm. That's a, a nice hunk of it. Um, Jax, I put a, a, doc, a Google Doc in the chat, which we started in this call a couple of calls ago uh, to try to collaboratively come up with a mission statement or a manifesto or a something or other to try to explain Neobooks. There's a couple other pages that are important to this. Uh, my best take on... Uh, on this is the Neobooks intro page, which is on the website. Uh, well, the, the OGM wiki kind of thing. I'll paste that into the chat here. So that that's my working introduction. That is actually a nugget that is a part of the Neobook that I'm writing about design from trust. This is the Neobooks introduction. There's also a design from trust introduction. Uh, and if you see the pages that point to this page, that will help you, you know, walk around uh, inside that draft. Excellent. So is this something that you're, uh, in terms of the the definitions and the or the descriptors and the and the understanding, it's something that you're still um, developing and and bouncing around and seeing what works and what doesn't and what lands with people and how the understanding of it. Yep. Yeah. So is yeah. it, is it concept that sort of that is um that's emerging in its descriptors especially exactly i'm going to share with you the video i cut for someone privately a, a couple of years ago how long ago was it uh 2022 so a couple of years ago uh, that is sort of a, a piece of how the neo books project showed up and if you watch that you'll get sort of the background notions right. of, of why and how mm -hmm. Cool. Well, and then I've seen that one, Jerry. You have? No, I said I don't think I have. Oh, so shoot. It's good. Okay. And then I've got one from 2010 that is the precursor to that, which is this video here about nuggets, narratives, and points of view, which is kind of the language we're using now, I think. Uh, but that was my the first post I did in when I invented Rex, which is the mastermind group I used to run that I that I started in 2010. Excellent. Sweet. My brain is full. I don't know about you guys. I'm good. Yeah. So much. <laughs> Zach, thank you so much for getting up at an odd hour to be with us. This is really, it was Aww. wonderful that you were here. Really helpful. Thank yeah. you. It's... What time is it there, uh, Jack? Uh, well, it was 3.30 when I got up and it's nearly five o'clock in the morning. Um, but often I wake up early anyway and at about this time and I'm often trying to get myself back to sleep. So it's actually nice to be doing something a bit more interesting. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, you've given me some um, this lovely food for thought, um, leaning on um, Klaus's food uh, work there. You've been, been wonderful with some really good areas that I can go and explore. My brain is definitely full, absolutely, as I knew it would be, as I knew it would be. Um, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And, um, yeah, I hope if it's okay, I might jump back in a few other times. And You are welcome to join us at any time. No, you're, you're, you add a lot to the conversation. We really appreciate your presence. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, yeah, and my, now, so let's just, let's just solve this name thing. Jose? Jose? Oh, okay. How to pronounce it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Think, think Jew. Yes. Eh. Jew, ze. Jew, ze. Jew, ze. Ze. Eh. Ze. Eh. Jew, ze. Yeah. Okay. L less of an A and more of an eh. Eh. Oh, Jew, ze. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sort of like I'm phonetically kind of like I wrote it in the chat, maybe? Oh yeah, yeah. Tuesday. Okay, great. Sweet. Tuesday. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, no, great. To thank you. you. Yeah. Very nice meeting you. Thanks everybody. Hopefully, see you all next Monday. Mm -hmm. Thanks, sir. Other calls. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye.